He's not here yet. We should start without him. Not so fast, ladies. Today, I have a little test for my viewers. Producers in their studios, mostly home studios, and nothing wrong with that, and hi-fi enthusiasts in their listening rooms. There may be a few audio files too. No problem. You're all welcome. Now, firstly, I have a warning. Betty. You must be listening on loudspeakers, headphones, or high-quality earbuds. If you're listening on your laptop or phone speakers or eBay earbuds, you'll be wasting your time. Yes, indeed. The last test I put out on YouTube attracted many comments from people who were listening on laptop speakers, their phone, many being mono or cheap earbuds. Obviously, they didn't hear anything useful, and I have to wonder why they ever expected to. Just to be clear, these are loudspeakers. These are headphones. I'll leave earbuds to viewer discretion. OK, the test. As I suggested in the title of the video, you may be able to hear the issue, or you may not. I know that I can't hear it. It's some music, or what I sometimes like to call music, overlaid with an issue. Now, I have to say that because I can't hear it, I don't know whether this will be painful for people who can. I suspect it will be irritating at most. But to be careful, what I'll do is start at a low level and increase the level slowly over the first seven or eight seconds. That will give you a chance to adjust your volume control if necessary. Final warning. Get your volume control ready. Here we go. Did you hear the problem? Did you not hear it? If you didn't hear it, then that is a problem. And as I said, I can't hear it myself. This is actually a real world problem. Not so much the real world of today, but not so long ago, it was very much something to listen out for, if you could. Let's hear it again, once again starting quietly. What you're hearing, or not hearing, is a high frequency tone mixed in with the music. And it's not just any old high frequency, it's something that you would, if you could, often hear in real life. Look at this. Believe it or not, this is what we used to call a television. Not nice and flat as televisions should be, but distinctly bulky in the rear. So what's taking up all this space? Answer, a cathode ray tube, or CRT. In its day, the CRT was a brilliant invention with a history going back to 1897 and applied to television in the 1920s by, well, by whom is probably a matter of dispute. Each country developed television entirely by itself without help from anyone in any other country. So in the UK, television was invented by the British. In the USA, the Americans. In Russia, you get the picture, no pun intended. Anyway, it was a great invention and it lasted a very long time before the flat screen displays we use today became good enough, reliable enough and cheap enough to take over. The way the CRT works is to shoot a beam of electrons at a phosphorescent screen, varying the brightness to create the image. That's the short story. The image is made up of lines, 525 in the USA, 625 in the UK. Other countries are available. To make the electron beam create the image of one line, then fly back quickly to start the next, the TV has a flyback transformer. Here's the thing. The flyback transformer works at a particular frequency, given by the number of lines in a frame and the number of frames each second. I told you there'd be maths involved. So in the USA, you have 30 frames per second times 525 lines equals 15,734 hertz. 
In the UK, 25 frames per second times 625 lines equals 15,625 hertz. Surprisingly similar. Actually, for the US, it's 29.97 frames per second, but that's a whole other story. And the legacy lingers today in that my camera is shooting at 29.97, when it could just have been a nice round 30. So far, so good, so what? Well, if the flyback transformer was doing its job nice and quietly, there wouldn't be a problem. But we have the phenomenon of magnetostriction, where... Magnetostriction is a property of magnetic materials that causes them to change their shape or dimensions during the process of magnetization. And, of course, a transformer works through electricity and magnetism. Effectively, it's an acoustic oscillator, working at 15,625 or 15,734 hertz. And some people can hear it. And, of course, it's not only some people who can hear it, microphones can hear it too. So if a CRT is used anywhere near recording equipment, as it will be in a TV studio, or maybe a CCTV in a sound studio, then there's the risk of this sound getting into the mics, then getting into the finished production. But what if the engineers are all old guys like me, who can't hear it? It is a genuine problem. Of course, the solution is to use TVs and video monitors of a professional level of quality, where measures have been taken to minimise this problem or fire all the old guys and replace them with the youth. <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. In professional audio, is it necessary to have perfect hearing to create good sound? And for hi-fi enthusiasts, there's always the question whether $1,000 cables sound no different to $10 cables, or maybe you just can't hear the difference. Anyone with good hearing would spot it straight away. If I tackle professional audio first, then anyone who can't hear above, say, 10 kilohertz is going to have a blind spot, or a deaf spot to be more appropriate, that they can't hear problems above that frequency, problems such as the one I've just described. But on the other hand, a 20-year-old with perfect hearing hasn't had time to develop the knowledge, skills and experience necessary to do good work with sound. It's like a master carpenter who's been given blunt chisels to work with, versus a rookie with the best tools available but hasn't yet learnt how to use them. Who's going to make the best chest of drawers? Professionally, though, there's an easy answer. The client or the market will decide. If an experienced but hearing-impaired audio pro can still satisfy his or her client or market, then all is well. In hi-fi, I'd turn the problem round a little. If your equipment is better than your ears, then you don't have to spend any more money on it. Just settle back and enjoy it. From my own experience, although my hearing may not be as good as it was in the high-frequency range, my enjoyment of music has increased massively over the years. And really, surely, it's only the enjoyment that counts. I get quite a lot of comments from people in a similar age group to me who've realised that their high-frequency range is restricted. Often in the vein of, woe is me, all is lost. All is not lost. The range of human hearing from the accepted 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz is 10 octaves. So, if your high-frequency range is restricted to 10 kilohertz, then you've lost just one of your octaves. You still have nine left. And I'm absolutely sure that for myself, my judgement in professional audio has done nothing but improve with experience and my enjoyment in listening to music, as I said, is better than ever. Let's listen to the problem again, this time with the aid of a spectrograph, so that you can see as well as hear, or not hear, what's going on. The frequency, by the way, is PAL 15,625 hertz, which is just a little bit lower and perhaps a little bit easier than NTSC. Aging sound engineers may benefit from this visual aid in their work. Plain as day. So, my questions to you would be, did you hear it? 
If you do have high frequency loss, does it matter, either professionally or for your personal enjoyment of music? Controversial, should people who can't hear all the way up to 20 kilohertz be banned from commenting on audio? <laughs> By the way, don't take my word for anything related to the biology of hearing. Go see an audiologist. See you soon. I'm going to get here early next time and start the video without him. But I quite liked that music. I think we should hear it again without the tone.